and we are live, guys. Here we are. Find your seat. <laughs> and look at the ocean. It's beautiful. Yay, Barbara. So nice to see you. Oh, my gosh. I will hug you after church. All right. Come on, you scragglers. Come on in. Good morning. Isn't it a beautiful day to worship the Lord together? And we got the ocean out there, and it's great just to be around God's creation when you worship him. So Rick is here today. Yay! He made it. He made it. And my heart is full. It's very good. And it's great. He has a sermon all ready to go. So we're going to do a mulligan and do John 4. <laughs> Jesus is going to be talking to the woman at the well in his teaching this morning. Don't you guys like running water? I mean, it's, isn't it like relaxing and pleasant? And it's just kind of refreshing, I think. Except when, like, you guys have plumbing problems or the rain comes in and there's water coming in. Not a good, or you have to go to the bathroom and you hear the running water. That, just, that doesn't work. Anyways, so, but Jesus says there's something, <laughs> there's something better than running water. He says in Matthew, Come to me, all who are weary and tired and thirsty, and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Isaiah says, with joy, you will draw water from the wells of salvation. In that day, you will sing to the Lord, for he has done glorious things. So that's what we're going to do this morning. So stand up, and we're going to sing God So Loved, and come all you weary. <coughs> Thank you. 
Ask us to come, come to you, because we are weary and heavy laden, and you are the one that will give us rest. It's so simple, but it's yet so difficult to lay down what we want in our will for the life that we truly desire, which only comes by looking to you, abiding in you, and beholding your glorious character. Because when we do, Lord, you are always there. You never leave us, and you never turn your backs on us, and you never disappoint. Help us, Father, to fix our eyes on you, not our problems. Those don't help. Thank you. We will find that you are good and that you are faithful. You are the author and perfection of our faith, Father, and you understand everything. Just like we sang, our hope is secure We don't fear anymore, and we praise you, the Lord of living waters. Amen. Well, say good morning to your neighbor and give Barbara Stevens a hug. This is so great. She's here.
<laughs> That's close enough. Okay, we'd like to encourage you to uh, resume a seat. No, everyone, okay, doing the more important thing of visiting. Yeah, it's true. True. <laughs> so I just wanted to uh, give a special thank you to Jerry for uh, last Sunday. Um, among, you know, when you, read, you see those uh, ads for the uh, pharmaceuticals on TV that you get so tired of, and they always come up with this uh, infinitely long list of um, side effects that they have. Yeah, I'm having those, you know, and uh, most of them are kind of the ones I've had. I've had a variety of them that are just a little bit annoying, and, but the one that has been a problem has been dealing with the the digestive tract and you know last Sunday morning I woke up very early in the morning with locksmith disease it's where you make a bolt for the bathroom door so uh, did that a lot uh, so that's why Jerry had to step in so thank you Jerry you did a great job appreciate you doing that and I continue to appreciate your prayers as uh, we deal with this feeling good today though so very thankful it's a delight to be with you guys here today um, so let's take a moment and just pray so, Father, I'm very thankful that I get to be here today and um, feel pretty good, and uh, that's great news. And, uh, Lord, we thank you for this beautiful day, what a gift it is, and what a gift it is to be with brothers and sisters in Christ and to be able to just sing and uh, rejoice in you. And, uh, Lord, we humble ourselves before you. You are worthy of all of our praise. We know that in our service, and um, we thank you that you even care about us. Uh, the ruler of all, amazing, that you are interested in us, and not just interested in us, but you love us and care about us, and we thank you for that. We certainly pray for uh, Mary Stepstad. She continues her treatments and uh, pray that she can get uh, tolerate them well. I know that they can be pretty rough, and so pray for her that she'll be able to tolerate that and it will be effective and that she'll be restored to health. We pray for BJ as she recovers from that uh, broken pelvis, and her brother Bill Farrington as he continues his battle. And um, Lord, I pray that the, my treatments will be effective as well. But mostly, Father, we want to thank you. Uh, we thank you that you, we can bring these requests to you and know that our lives are in your hands and uh, that you do care about us. And so we ask now that you teach us, Lord, strengthen us in our faith as we look at your word. We pray this in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. So every now and then, I'm sure like you, mo movie lines or movie scenes and lines pop into my head, you know, from the past. And, you know, especially, you know, some of those classic lines like, you can't handle the truth. Uh, or, you messed with the wrong Marine from A uh, Few Good Men. And sometimes it's something like, so you're saying there's a chance, you know, a dumb and dumber classic line. Uh, but... The last couple of weeks, there was a scene that rattled around in my head from one of my old fa favorites uh, from Field of Dreams. And there's a scene in Field of Dreams where the central character, Ray, has taken uh, the famous writer, Terrence Mann, to a baseball game at Fenway Park in, in Boston. And so, you know, there's a whole lot that goes into why they're there, but they're going up to a concession stand and they're talking about... Terrence Mann and his life, but that he had been once a famous writer, and now he has been kind of a recluse and talking about his life and what it's about. And um, Ray finally says to him, so what do you want? And Terry responds kind of almost angrily, 
What do I want? I want them to stop looking to me for answers, begging me to speak again, begging me to write and to be a leader. I want them to start thinking for themselves. I want my privacy. And then Ray uh, gestures to the concession stand. He says, no, what do you want? <laughs> oh, I want a hot dog. <laughs> you know? What do you want? That's the question. And maybe more important than that, what do you need is a question that we all should be thinking about at times. And um, this, uh, you know, we've been told recently, have been told that there's a need that we all have that I didn't even know about until just recently. And that is that uh, we need to be safe from a deadly appliance in our kitchen, a gas stove. I, who knew? You know, actually, I feel like what I need to be saved from is the nanny state. But anyway, you know, unfortunately, we humans, when you ask that question, what do we need? Um, we tend to maybe not get focused on what we really need because we tend to have uh, some things that are um, we're a little bit myopic, you know, because there are immediate needs. There are these present needs that kind of drown out everything else. And one of the things that we forget about is that the most important things usually are not the loudest things in our lives. The loudest things are the things that are immediate and they shout for our attention. The important things somehow can get shoved back into the corner. So this morning we're going to see Jesus talking to a person about what you really need and even what you want, but though you may not know it, that we all need and want. But it's one of those things that isn't the most loud shouting thing in life. So it's a familiar story. It's in uh, John chapter 4. And it's a story of a woman that Jesus encounters. So here's what happens. Now Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was uh, gaining and baptizing more disciples than John, although in fact it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. So he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well, and it was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us this well and drank from it himself as did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you're right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you have had five husbands, and the man you have now is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem, you Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, well, I know that Messiah, called Christ, is coming. When he comes, he'll explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, am he. Just then his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asked, what do you want or why are you talking with her? Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? 
they came out of town and made their way toward him. Well, so what we see here is Jesus encountered a thirsty woman. She's there getting water. Um, Jesus has left Jerusalem because uh, things were getting a little hot. Um, The leaders were starting to really be unhappy with him. And so he decides to turn down the heat. He'll leave Jerusalem for a while and go back to Galilee. Now, verse 4 says he had to go through Samaria. Judea... Uh, where Jerusalem is, kind of more in the south of Israel, just to the north of Samaria, and north of that is where Galilee is. So, you know, back when our son Toby was at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, and we went to visit him in San Luis Obispo, to go north, you always had to go through Los Angeles. You know, you're going to get to San Luis Obispo, got to go through L.A., which was terrible. Driving through Los Angeles is miserable, isn't it? But the problem is, if you, if you want to say, I want to avoid Los Angeles, well, you'd have to go out, way out the 15 and go all the way out through the desert, and drive out through the desert and drive over through Tehachapi into the Central Valley and then up the Central Valley and then over. It would add hours to your drive. It's not worth it, even though it's annoying to drive through L.A. Well, going from Jerusalem up to uh, Galilee, the most direct way to get there is right through Samaria. Um, The problem was that Jews and Samaritans just did not get along at all. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. And so it wasn't uncommon. In fact, it was quite common for Jews who were going to go north or south to make a detour, kind of like driving around Los Angeles. They would actually go up the Jordan River Valley to the east and go up that way around Samaria and then cut back over to the west once they got got north of Samaria, which would add time to their travel, but it was a way of avoiding having to go through Samaritan territory. So when you read this and you see where John says, well, Jesus had to go through Samaria, there's a little bit more to that than just geography. Yeah, the most direct route was to go through Samaria, but lots of Jews didn't. Jesus had to go there because he had an appointment with someone. They didn't know they had an appointment with him, but Jesus knew it. There was a woman that he needed to talk to, and that's why he had to go through Samaria. So we meet this person in verse 7. Jesus arrives at this town called Sychar, probably near a town now called Ascar. Um, Jacob's well was there. Uh, Jesus' guys go into town to find a fast food place to get some lunch, for it's the middle of the day. Jesus is tired, so he sits down at the well to rest, and this woman comes out of town. And Jesus says, well, would you give me a drink of water, because I'm thirsty? And she responds in an odd way. Uh, She says, you are a Jew and I'm a Samaritan. How can you ask me for a drink? Which is kind of a strong Uh, odd reaction, you know, except that you realize that Jesus is breaking down, breaking through a number of social barriers here. First of all, there's just the fact that she's a woman, a single woman by herself, and he's a single man. For a religious man in his society, they didn't talk to a single unoccupied, unaccompanied woman, uh, excuse me, not unoccupied, unaccompanied woman, (laughs) Uh, and so uh, that was odd. But then there's the fact she's not just a woman. She's a Samaritan woman. Um, there's a big problem between Samaritans and Jews, as I mentioned. The Samaria, the, the problem kind of started with the Samaria was part of the, uh, the group of tribes, the northern nation, northern tribes of Israel, when there was a problem with uh, Rehoboam, Solomon's son, that levying, levying taxes. This was hundreds and hundreds of years earlier. There was basically what kind of was a civil war. The northern tribe said, we're not going to do that anymore. They split off from Judah and Benjamin in the south and turned one nation into two nations. There was North Israel and South Israel. And so they created another nation. So there was kind of a national problem there. And then uh, in order for them to 
keep their what they felt was their independence. The, the problem they had, and the, the law of Moses said, well, you have to, everybody has to go down to Jerusalem to worship the, the God of Israel. Well, the problem for them is if, if they're going to be an independent nation, they don't want to have to be going down to that other nation to worship down there. So they created their own center of worship, even though it violated what the law of Moses said. And so they ended up basically creating their own heretical religion. So now you have, you have a political problem, and now you have a religious problem. And then the um, Assyrians came along and conquered northern Israel. And when they did, they took many of the people who lived there and moved them out to other parts of the world and moved other people from other parts of the world, Gentiles, into that region. And they intermarried with the, the people that lived there and created essentially a mixed race. And now you've got a racial problem. So the problem here is that you have this political, religious, racial, cultural hatred going on between Jews and Samaritans. In fact, in the years before Jesus' life, there were a couple of incidents where there were, there were outbreaks of violence uh, between the two, the Samaritans and Jews. And so this woman is shocked. Here's this Jewish man. He's speaking to me, a woman. Now there's one other obstacle that Jesus blew through when he spoke to this woman. And there's a reason that she's out there at the well by herself at noon. That's not when the women typically went out to get water. They usually would make a couple of trips, one at the early in the day in the morning and one at the end of the day because it was cooler. Noon is the hottest part of the day in the Middle East. She's out there getting water at noon by herself because none of the other women will have anything to do with her. And she didn't want to be around them because she was going to face a lot of ostracism whenever she was around the other women. Because this woman had led a less than sterling life. And her reputation was well known in the town. So Jesus here is now flying right by a lot of barriers. Religious, political, uh, social barriers, including, you know, just saying, I'm going to talk to this woman even though nobody else in the town wants anything to do with her. And so Jesus said, um, you know, he, he, he says, uh, if you knew the gift of God, you'd be asking me for a drink of water. And I would give you living water. Now, you know, there's this interesting thing about Jesus. If you remember the, his conversation with Nicodemus in chapter 3, there was a, Nicodemus began the conversation by complimenting Jesus. We know you're a teacher because of all the great things you do. And Jesus just blew right through the small talk. He just ignored what Nicodemus said and said, well, if you want to enter the kingdom of God, you've got to be born again. Well, nice segue, Jesus, you know. He does the same thing here. This woman says, I can't believe you're asking me, a Samaritan woman, for water. And Jesus said, well, if you knew who you were talking to, you'd ask me for water, and I'd give you living water. Kind of just ignores what she said and blows right to the real point here. Now, um, she, she, uh, she understands him to be just claiming that he can give her water. In other words, she kind of misses the whole spiritual point that Jesus is aiming at. Uh, and she says, well, how are you going to give me water? I mean, you don't have anything. That, this well is deep. How are you going to get down there and get water and bring it up for me? Uh, she's just talking about regular old water. And so Jesus says, look, everyone who drinks this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks the water I give will never thirst. Uh, now, this sounds really good to this woman. You know, it's hard for us to really understand uh, maybe how great that would be. But, you know, you think about it. If you're thirsty, you're at home and you're thirsty, what do you do? Well, you go to the kitchen and you get a glass, put it on the faucet and get water out and 
out of the faucet and drink it. She, she couldn't do that. She couldn't do anything like that. In fact, she would have thought having running water like we have in our kitchens and our bathrooms, she would have thought she died gone to heaven. Um, you know, the, the average American uses 80 to 100 gallons of water a day. Now, a lot of that is for landscaping, you know, watering the lawn and whatever, and for uh, flushing toilets, taking showers, washing clothes. A lot of the water goes to those things, as well as cooking and um, just drinking. Um, so, you know, the average person in India, for instance, doesn't do a lot of the things we do. They only use an average of about 38 gallons of water a day. Uh, let's say that this woman had much reduced needs for water, maybe 10 gallons of water a day for her. Now she's living with a man, so the two of them are going to need 20 gallons of water a day. Here's the problem. She's got to take some containers out to that well and fill them up with water and bring them out. For every ounce of water that they drink or use in cooking or washing their clothes, you got to go out to the well, fill up containers, and bring them back. Here's the problem. Water weighs about 8.3 pounds per gallon. Between the two of them, they need 20 gallons a day. That means she has to haul 160 pounds worth of water home every day. And so when she hears Jesus say, I'm going to give you water, you drink my water, you'll never have to drink again, never be thirsty again. That sounds great to her because that's going to make her life a lot easier. And that's all she's thinking about. She's thinking purely on the physical level. Great water, that's, I'm, I'll never be thirsty again. I'm not going to have to haul as much water. My life's going to be a lot better. This sounds wonderful to me. That's all she's really thinking about. How can my life right now be a little easier? That's what she wants. That's what she thinks is the best she could hope for. But Jesus identified the woman's real need. And I think we can learn a little bit from this woman because most of us, the, the norm for human beings is to be pretty much preoccupied with how can my life be easier and better right now. We think that's what we need most and that's what we want just like she did. In fact, we're preoccupied with that. Um, you know, what are most people concerned about? Well, money, success, uh, approval, friendship, just health, feeling better. Those are the things that really we think we really need and want. That's kind of like her. I want my life to be easier and better. And that's what's important. We don't have the same daily demands that she did, you know, her life. I think sometimes uh, we forget how hard it was to live back then. Just getting food was a, an ordeal. Cooking food, accomplishing everything was so much harder. So you can understand why she'd be concerned about having life be easier. But even for us, we get preoccupied with that. Now, Jesus... Jesus is human. He understands human beings because he is one. And he understands that preoccupation with the, the, just the demands of life. And so he realizes he's going to have to do something to get this woman to think at a different level. And so he does. He says to her, I'll tell you what. Why don't you go call your husband and bring him back and let's talk when you come back. Uh, well, now he's getting personal. And she says, well, I have no husband. And Jesus says, yeah, isn't that the truth? You've had five, and the guy you're with now isn't your husband. Now, there's a, uh, there's a difference between Greek and English that uh, actually comes into play here that often gets overlooked. And the, the difference is that in Greek, uh, you know, most of the time Greek was 
very specific and had very specific uh, expressions for everything. They, this is an, a, uh, an instance where it's a little bit less specific than English because in Greek, they didn't have a word it was specifically for husband or for wife. The husband, the word for husband and the word for wife in Greek was just man and woman, which I've always thought would have made weddings a little bit different. You know, when you get to that place where you say, I now pronounce you man and woman. Well, what were they before? You know, I don't think they did it the same way. But anyway, um, and so when you see what goes on here in this conversation, what Jesus says is, why don't you go call your man? She says, I don't have a man, which wasn't true. And Jesus says, yeah, that's really true. You've had five men, and the man you're with now isn't your man. I, this woman probably had not been married at all. She just lived with five men. And the guy, when Jesus says, the guy you're living with now, he's not your man. He's probably somebody else's man. She's probably living with somebody, some other woman's man. Uh, you know, you, you might think, well, uh, you know, why is Jesus bringing, why doesn't he stick to religious matters? He's kind of sticking his nose in her personal business and kind of shaming her. That's not really his point is not to shame her. We need to notice her reaction when Jesus brings up this, well, why don't you go call your man that you're living with now? And her, what was her response? I don't have a man. Well, that's not true. She's covering up because she feels guilty. She's ashamed of her own lifestyle, and she wants to just not admit what's going on in her life. And here's the thing. Jesus understands that she feels shame and she feels guilt. And he knows she is never going to experience living water until she's freed of that guilt. And so he says, we're going to get that into the open here. And we're going to talk about what you really need. That's why he brings this up. You know, as long as she's covering up and trying to hide, She's never going to be free of that guilt. You know, we, our house uh, that we live in now, it's 32 years old, which I can't, you know, we bought it. It was brand new. And I think, how can it be that old? But it's that old. And one of the things, you know, when a house is 32 years old, it develops issues. You know, in the 32 years uh, since we've lived there, I've developed issues too. But the house... <laughs> You know, they develop issues. One of the things that happens with houses is they kind of, over time, settle a little bit. And as the house settles a little bit, sometimes you get cracks in the walls. And we have some cracks in our walls. Now, it's superficial cracks, the paint cracks. And, and so, you know, Lori, has always, she's been a little bugged by that. She goes, oh, we got to do something about these cracks. And I look at it and think, eh, it's just a, you know, it's just the paint. That's not a big deal. But we had one crack in our living room that just got worse and worse and pretty much began to look like a model of the Grand Canyon, you know. And it's like, okay, you know what? We got to do something about it. We, and when you finally face the fact, that's when you have to do something about it. And this woman's not wanting to face the fact of her life. And Jesus is going to shock her out of that. Because the only way she's going to find real life is to be free of the guilt that she experiences. And so he brings us up to force her to do that. You know, this woman um, deserves some sympathy. Back in that day in their society, um, women were very much powerless. Couldn't own property, couldn't hold a job. So a woman really could not support herself. So the only way that she could live was if there was a man who would support her. Um, her, her father would support her until she was given in marriage to a man who would then support her. And a woman without a man to support her was going to be in serious problems. 
How could she support herself? And this poor woman has been used by men. That's why she's had five men, never really been married. She's been rejected. She's been used by men. I don't think she's a scarlet woman, libertine, you know, just flaunting all morals. She's just trying to survive. She has done what she has done because it's what she had to do to get by. Life has been difficult for her, and she's ashamed of what she's done. Jesus is going to free her from that. And with this revelation that Jesus knew all about her past, even though he had never met her before, this woman realizes, well, this is not your average Jewish man. Something about this guy is really different. And she says the best she can come up with is, I see that obviously you're a prophet. You know things that only God could reveal to you. Um, she knows now they're not talking about just some physical magic water. Uh, they're talking about something much deeper, real life, and the life that she would love to have and doesn't have. She knows the interesting thing is you can see with her response, she immediately starts talking about, well, how do you worship? Did you notice that? that her response when Jesus brings up this issue and she realizes who he is, she starts talking about, well, you know, you Jews say you got to go to Jerusalem to worship. We say you worship here. Here's the thing that we need to notice from that. She understands that this living water that Jesus is talking about, that's e eternal life, that's a life that actually is, begins right now and is like something welling up from inside a person, she understands that that living water has to do with spiritual things. It has now, he, she's realizing it has to do with how you connect with God. And so she immediately goes to the question of, well, how do I do that? You know, there's a lot of different ideas about how you connect with God. That's why she's raising that. And that's the point that she understands that many people in our culture don't understand. That this living water has to do with how we connect with God. And that's because God is the source of life. And he is the only source of life. We're not going to get living water anywhere else. So Jesus cuts through all of her stuff about, oh yeah, where's the right place to worship? What's the right way to do it? And he goes right to the heart of the matter. He says, a time is coming and now has arrived when none of that is going to matter. Not going to care where you have to go to worship or what's the right procedure because God cares about people who worship in spirit and truth. In other words, it doesn't have to do with rituals or with specific places or religious practices. It has to do with what's in the heart. In his book, Authentic Christianity, Ray Stedman wrote that the, the one mark of false religion, including false Christianity, is that it always is deeply concerned with the importance of things Stones, rituals, ceremonies, buildings, stained glass windows, spires, organs, proper procedures, rituals. That's what false religion is always like. And it's not the real thing. Jesus said, and his person, this time has arrived when it's time to worship God in spirit and truth. Now, every now and then, um, you'll read or, or hear preachers talk about well, what does it mean to work, worship in spirit and truth? And they'll talk about what it means to worship in spirit. And they'll talk about what it means to worship in truth. And they give big theological explanations of it. Um, first of all, uh, the grammar indicates he's not talking about two things, worship in spirit and worship in truth. He's talking about one. The grammar indicates worship in spirit and truth is one thing. You, in other words, you're worshiping from the heart truly. Okay, it's the real thing from the heart. Um, but the other thing we need to think about is the context of this. Jesus is talking to a woman who doesn't have theological training, probably isn't 
very educated. She's certainly not deeply uh, ingrained in theology. She's a simple woman. And so when Jesus says to her with no other explanation, time has come now to worship God in spirit and truth, and doesn't say anything else about it, he expected her to understand that because it's simple. So let's not complicate it. Worship in spirit and truth. I mean, worship God truly from your heart. That's what he's saying. Well, she gets immediately, that sounds great. And I know that must have to do with when Messiah comes. He's going to change everything. We know that that's when things are going to change. And Jesus says, lady, you're talking to him. And she knows it's true. And her reaction as she runs into town and says, you've got to come talk to this guy. He told me everything about my life. He knows it all. He's the Messiah. So, okay, what does this mean to us today? Well, implications of this, first of all, is it's possible to have this living water. You know, Jesus claimed, I'm going to give you something that makes it possible for you not to thirst. Um, and it has to do with the kind of life that you have. I'm going to bring and give you a life that is going to be connected with an eternal life. And it's a life that's going to be like having a spring inside you, welling up, continually flowing, so that you're not actually continually looking for something else. It's a life of satisfaction and fulfillment. doesn't leave us with this sense of, I need more, more, more all the time. I've got what I need. The imagery is very vivid. You know, so what is this living water like? You know, my first thought, you know, when you think that is, well, I guess you're going to have a life that's so good you don't need anything else. You know, everything's going to be just great. But... Um, you know, you think, well, if I'm unhappy or if I'm, my situation is miserable, I'm going to be wanting something else. So that, that can't be, you know, that's not living water. But, you know, when you think about that, you have to realize, well, but all of us are going to go through times in life that we don't like our circumstances. And none of us are going to be in a situation where we're just happy with everything. We never feel sad or never have any. That can't be it, Right. We need to pay attention to what Jesus said. He said, this life, there's going to be living water in you. It's going to come from inside. It's not going to be dependent upon what's going on outside. It doesn't have to do with circumstances. It's the quality of life that's inside of us that we will bring to our circumstances, whatever they may be. So whoever drinks this water won't thirst again, meaning um, we won't need to go somewhere to get more of it. We'll have the life we need that can give us what we need to deal with whatever circumstances come along. That's what he's telling us. You know, a couple of weeks ago, well, three weeks ago now, uh, Lori and I were at the cancer center for my second treatment. Um, Lori came with me. You know, nobody is happy at the, the uh, cancer center where, you know, everybody's getting... Uh, chemotherapy. Nobody's having fun there. Um, you know, I mean, it's not that everybody's grumpy and unhappy, but it's just a hard place to be because everybody who's there is going through a difficult thing. Um, Lori and I were, so, you know, most of the people there are kind of stressed because it's, it's hard. So we're there and uh, Lori and I are talking as I'm getting my infusion and um, we're talking about Mexican restaurants because we had this idea that maybe after the infusion I would go out to eat. That proved to be a bad idea, so we <laughs> didn't do that. But, but at that point, you know, before I started feeling bad, we start we were talking about Mexican restaurants and, and we were mentioning several of them. And then at one point, Lori said, "Oh, there's that one. Oh, what's the name of it? You know, it's the one. It has the same name as the fertilizer." <laughs> I thought, what? What are you talking about? Fertilizer? Yeah, she said, you know, that, she said, remember that commercial that had the, 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 the mountain of fertilizer? And all of a sudden they got it, you know. 
There was a commercial uh, like 40 years ago. I don't know if you remember this. Had this mountain, 100 foot tall mountain of uh, fertilizer called Bandini Mountain. Do you remember that? It had a guy skiing down Bandini Mountain. And I thought, you're talking about Cassidy Bandini. She goes, yeah, you know. Well, I had the same reaction you did. I just started laughing. And Lori started laughing, and we're sitting there, and both of us are just laughing hysterically, and we are the only people in the cancer center laughing. And we were just, I mean, it was quite a while before we finally got over the Bandini Mountain as a Mexican restaurant. Um, and I was thinking about that, and I thought, you know, um, I tell you that because in a way it illustrates uh, what I think Jesus is talking about. Because being married to Lori kind of creates a way of living that has some similarities to that. You know, there's a, with her, there's great comfort, there's great encouragement, there's great love, there's great joy. And that's what gives you the strength in difficult situations. And that's what Jesus is telling us. It's more than even just being with Lori, although that's great, you know, that having a relationship with God through him is going to give us the encouragement and the hope and the love and the joy and the strength that we need to deal with whatever comes along our way. We'll fill our lives with meaning and we have what we need there. That's what he's talking about when he talks about living water. Doesn't mean well, life, life will be unicorns and roses all the time. And it, it won't be, and we know that. It doesn't mean we won't feel the stress of hard times. We won't feel the grief and the sadness of those losses. We will. But in the middle of them, we will have something that gives us the strength and the hope and the love and the joy to keep going. That's the living water that he's talking about. Here's a, a really cool thing about this. Living water is available to every human being. Remember Jesus had to go through Samaria. Do you know why? Because he wanted his followers and us to understand that truth, that living water is available to everybody. So he's going to pick out someone that he thinks his followers can't imagine would ever be a candidate for having living water coming from the kingdom of God. A Samaritan, a woman with a horrible reputation, a woman that religious people would say, no, she, she's disqualified. She surely can't be one who would have living water. And Jesus picks this woman out and says, she is going to have living water. Jesus' disciples weren't really all that happy about that, you know? They didn't want anything to do with Samaritans, and they certainly didn't want to have anything to do with a Samaritan woman with a bad reputation. And Jesus is saying, I have come that anyone and everyone can have living water through me. Put faith in me, and I don't care about race. I don't care about culture. I don't care about your background, about your failings, about your inadequacies. Anyone can have this living water through faith in me. That's what he's saying. Here's another thing that's important that we learn from this incident, and that is that neither religion nor the world can give us living water. You know, the interesting thing about this woman is she, with all of her, her problems, like I said, she, she lived like she did because she was just trying to survive. But she had some religion. She believed. But her religion had not given her and could never give her living water because religion can't. You know, having rituals and rules to follow at the right place not going to give you living water. You need something real and much more powerful than that. And furthermore, 
The world couldn't give her living water. No amount of running water, <laughs> indoor plumbing, could give her the life that she wanted. Yeah, it'd make her life now easier, but it can't give her eternal life and can't give her the life that she longs for. And those are things that we need to recognize. That for us, we tend to have that same thing of falling back to thinking, oh yeah, the living water, our culture believes and preaches that God is irrelevant to it, and what we need is the stuff of this world. That's what's going to give us living water, the life we want. Will never happen. Can't happen. And that's what this story reminds us of. So one last thing, that is that true worship of Jesus is the source of living water. There's a pastor of a big church back in Illinois, an author, his name is Jim Nicodem, and he says, you were designed to be a worshiper and you will never experience lasting significance or satisfaction in life if you neglect worship. Nothing else can take the place of that worship that worship is intended to fill in your life. Writer uh, A.W. Tozer said, without worship, we go about miserable. Without worship, we're going to be miserable because human beings are made to worship. Um, what a stark contrast. The ultimate contrast that human beings are faced with is you have a choice. You can either worship or you can be miserable. That's your choice. Which one do you want? What's amazing is people keep changing, choosing misery because they don't want to worship. But the reality is we do worship. We will worship. Nothing can stop human beings from worshiping. The problem is we worship ourselves, and it brings us death. You know, misery or worship, which brings life, seems like an easy decision, doesn't it? You know, have you seen that commercial on TV for the bank where they say, well, you know, this is the easiest decision in the history of decisions. And then they, they show a scene where it's a uh, recreational softball uh, game, and the coach says, I need a pinch hitter, and I want Derek. And this guy stands up and he says, no, not you. I want Derek Jeter, you know, the all Hall of Fame player. And he's there, and he stands up, you know. Which Derek do you want? Well, I'll take Derek Jeter, easiest decision in the history of decisions. Uh, which do you want, misery or worship? It seems like that's the easiest decision in the history of decisions, doesn't it? And yet people continually make the wrong one. It's actually rare to find people who actually have living water, isn't it? Who have bring life to every situation, and yet Jesus says we can have that, and we have that by worshiping him in spirit and truth. It, it doesn't come from just worship. You know, that's what our culture kind of wants to, maybe we'll move in that direction. Oh, yeah, yeah we're just worship. Worship anything, something. Look, if you worship Jobu, you know, the idol from the movie Major League, you know, I don't know if you remember that one, you're not going to get living water out of that. You have to worship the one who brings life because he created life, and that's Jesus. Um, to worship means to declare the worth of something, to declare its worthship. That's where that comes from. So to worship Jesus in spirit and truth is to say with our words and actions, he's more valuable than anything else in this world. And I want more than anything to honor him with all that I am and all that I do. And here's the great promise. If we will worship Jesus in spirit and truth, we will have living water. We can have a life. It's not going to be perfect, but it will be full of meaning and it will be full of satisfaction and fulfillment. It will have love. It will have hope. It will have strength, encouragement, joy, and peace. You can rejoice in it every day and you can bring that life to every circumstance that you experience. To the degree that we look for life by worshiping Jesus, making our life about that, we will experience living water. To the degree that we try to find it in other things, we will only find misery. 
Do you remember when you were a kid and uh, your group, you're going to play a game? Maybe it was kickball or football or basketball or baseball, or whatever. And the way you, you decide how, who was going to be on what team is you'd they'd be the two best players or the most popular kids would be selected captains. And then what would they do? Well, one by one, they would choose people for their team. Remember that one? And you remember, I, maybe you never had this happen, but you remember the humiliation of one by one people being picked and you're not, you know, and you get picked late, and, or maybe you even suffered the humiliation of you were the last one picked, which meant you weren't even chosen. You were just what was left over and they had to take you because it was all that was left. You remember that? Um, I, I imagine something like that happening to you as an adult in your chosen career. Well, uh, there's a guy, you've probably heard this story already, but I want to bring up the story this morning for a reason. There's a guy who has had that happen to him in his chosen career. Um, his name is Brock Purdy. And he was chosen in the NFL draft last year with the very last pick. The last guy chosen. And every year, they have a name, a title they give to the guy that gets the last pick in the NFL draft. They call him Mr. Irrelevant. <laughs> And the reason is because everybody knows he has no chance of making an NFL team. Um, most people thought when the San Francisco 49ers picked Brock Purdy with that last pick, it was a throwaway pick. They already had two quarterbacks. They didn't need a quarterback. They picked him. He's a quarterback. He was not a highly regarded quarterback. In fact, he's a kid that wasn't recruited out of high school by college as much, and somehow he finally got a college scholarship offer at Iowa State, which was a lousy program. Uh, he elevated the program, but not a highly regarded guy. And so everybody thought, well, they'd just pick this guy because they didn't know what else to do with the pick. Brock Purdy surprised people, battled his way, and actually made the roster of that team as the third string quarterback. And then the first string quarterback in the second game got injured out for the rest of the season. Well, the second string quarterback started playing, and they were playing well, and the 49ers looked like one of the best teams in the NFL, and the second string quarterback got hurt. And all of a sudden, Brock Purdy, Mr. Irrelevant, <laughs> is the starting quarterback for the 49ers, and everybody said, well, there goes the 49ers season. They're toast. This kid is not, not going to be able to do it. And he shocked everyone. Led that team to seven straight wins and has played amazingly well. And he'll be playing here in just a few minutes in a playoff game. He's already won one playoff game. Here's why I recite his story. Listen to what Brock says. He says, every time I play, no matter what happens, I want others to see God through my actions. Every time I step on the field, I want to bring him glory. Even when we lose, I want to point to God and thank him for the opportunity. Everything happens for a reason. It's all a lesson from the Lord. This is a game. It's not my life. Brock Purdy is having living water because he's worshiping in spirit and truth. Let's do the same. Let's close in prayer. Father, uh, what great news it is that we can have living water flowing from within, and it's available to everyone. We often feel inadequate, Lord. You know this. We feel like um, we don't measure up. We're not deserving because we see our failures and our flaws. And how cool it is to see this story where there's a woman that had lots of failures and lots of flaws. And Jesus specifically sought her out to bring her living water. So, Lord, I pray you'll help us to remember that and help us to remember where living water comes from. It's not going to come from outside of us, not going to come from our circumstances. It's going to come from worshiping you 
from living for your glory, for the glory of Jesus Christ and serving you and wanting to declare the worth of Jesus Christ more than anything else in everything we are and everything we do. Help us, Lord, to do that so that we can experience living water flowing from within. Amen. Now stand with us and let's sing our last song, O Glorious Day. for Janet. We're going to sign that. And there's journals back there. You guys can use those for worship and things that you want God to just remember or you won't forget. So just prayer requests. So take those with you. Okay. Thanks for coming. One, two, three.